Today's lecture is the second in the series of lectures dealing specifically with immune dysfunction. Again, we spent the entire semester working on understanding how the immune system functions, all the nuances with the different facets, innate immune response, adaptive immune response, complement system, and the like. Now that we have that good foundational understanding of how the immune system functions, we're going to discuss issues that arise when the immune system does not function properly. Our first lecture, the last one that I posted, was dealing specifically with hypersensitivity. Hypersensitivity, again, is an exaggerated immune response that typically has deleterious effects and causes damage to the individual. Hypersensitivity is an issue with recognition. Typically, environmental factors or components are recognized as a potential threat by the immune system and an immune response is elicited. This problem then causes typically excess periods of inflammation, which then cause a whole variety of problems in the individuals suffering from hypersensitivity. The next category, which we will discuss in our third lecture, is immunodeficiencies. This is a situation where you have a deficiency in some aspect of the immune response. There's a failure of some or all of the parts of the immune system to function at all. That too is divided into primary immunodeficiency, which is a condition that results from a genetic or developmental defect in the immune system and secondary immunodeficiency, an acquired condition resulting in a defect or dysfunction of the immune system. So again, immunodeficiencies will be the topic of our next lecture after this one. And lastly, our lecture for today deals specifically with autoimmunity. Now, autoimmunity is also an inappropriate response of the immune system. However, in this case, the recognition problem comes into play where self components are being recognized as potential threats and immune responses are elicited against those self components. In a sense, it is a mechanism of self-destruction. Autoimmunity is typically kept in check with a mechanism known as tolerance. So tolerance, again, I've mentioned throughout the semester or alluded to it throughout the semester, is a built-in mechanism that exists to protect an individual from potentially self-reactive lymphocytes. And when we talk about autoimmunity, it is in fact those class of cells referred to as the lymphocytes that play a really big role in this uh, dysfunction. All right, so let's look at tolerance and autoimmunity in a little more detail. The first thing I want to mention is that, again, this is a type of dysfunction. I should say autoimmunity is a type of dysfunction. It's a problem in the ability to distinguish self from non-self. How this happens is when there is a failure of what is known as tolerance. So tolerance um, is a mechanism or a series of mechanisms that allows for protection from potentially reactive um, self-reactive lymphocytes. The tolerance mechanism is divided into two broad categories, which we'll look at in the subsequent slides. There's what's known as central tolerance, which occurs in the primary lymphoid organs, which again are bone marrow and thymus. And with central tolerance, there is a deletion of T cells or B cells before they come mature if there is a problem detected with those B cells and T cells and potential self reactivity, meaning their potential to bind to self antigens. There's also something known as peripheral tolerance and peripheral tolerance is a mechanism that occurs in the secondary lymphoid organs. The central tolerance mechanism is not perfect, and hence there are peripheral tolerance mechanisms that provide additional safeguards against self-reactive lymphocytes. However, when tolerance mechanisms fail, autoimmunity arises. And what happens typically with autoimmunity is you not only get destruction of self-components or self-cells, but you get increased inflammation and cellular and tissue damage in the host system.
There are many examples of autoimmune disorders, and we will look at a table a little bit later in the lecture. But just for example, there are things such as rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, lupus, to name a few of the most common or um, uh, well-known types of autoimmune disorders. In the slide here, what you're looking at is another example of an autoimmune disorder. This is diabetes mellitus. This is also known as type 1 diabetes. And in the left-hand side, you see a normal islet of Langerhans cells in the pancreas. These are normally functioning cells that produce insulin for the individual in question. On the right, you see an example of an individual that does in fact have type 1 diabetes. In this case, what you see is an infiltration of lymphocytes in these islet of Langerhans cells, um, which are causing the destruction overall of those cells and then inhibits the production of insulin in these individuals. As I mentioned in the previous slide, there are two mechanisms of tolerance. The first one, the focus of this slide, is what's known as central tolerance. Central tolerance occurs in the primary lymphoid organs, specifically within the bone marrow and the thymus. In the bone marrow, the target of this mechanism are B cells, and in the thymus, obviously, the target are T cells. This, in fact, is the dominant mechanism that occurs to protect an individual from potentially self-reactive lymphocytes. If we go back to what we discussed uh, in discussing T cells, you hopefully recall that there is a complex mechanism that is in place for T cell maturation. What we discussed during that T cell maturation were two different mechanisms. There was one mechanism known as positive selection, which allowed for the cells that could in fact interact with MHC to survive, because again, if a T cell is unable to inter interact with MHC, it's basically a useless T cell. But the second mechanism that we encountered when we discussed this process was negative selection. And in negative selection, we had those specific uh, lymphocytes, excuse me, um, thymocytes that were tested against self antigens. They were tested against self antigens in the thymus. And if those cells did in fact interact with self antigens, they were destroyed. When we discussed this mechanism, we looked at it in a lot more detail, um, and we'll discuss it again in a few slides. So um, we'll come back to that concept. In B cells, there is also a negative selection process. Autoreactive components are destroyed so that B cells do not continue to develop with the potential to bind to self antigens. What you see in the slide is just an overview or summary of that process in that the developing lymphocyte, whether it's a B cell or a T cell, is checked against self antigens and those that do in fact bind to self antigens are destroyed, whereas those that do not continue on um, and develop. Now, it turns out that that central tolerance mechanism is actually extremely effective. However, it is not a perfect mechanism. Sometimes self-reactive lymphocytes can make it through uh, to the secondary lymphoid tissues and organs. And in this case, peripheral tolerance would be a backup mechanism to prevent interaction with self antigens. So on the left hand of the slide, what you see is what we would consider a normal response to a foreign antigen. We have lymphocytes interacting with that antigen to then eventually lead to the production of more lymphocytes with a response to that specific antigen. Again, that's the normal response. On the right hand side, what you see is a lymphocyte that is interacting with a self antigen. And in this case, there are two potential fates for that lymphocyte. The first is destruction via apoptosis, and we've discussed apoptosis multiple times throughout the semester. This results 
when the concentration of antigen is below a threshold. And we're gonna look at a little more detail associated with what allows for apoptosis to take place. There is an alternative to what happens to self-reactive uh, lymphocytes. And this is a process or mechanism known as energy. Energy is a state of unresponsiveness to antigenic stimulus. So what happens is these cells, even though they interact with antigen, are basically made non-functional. They're not destroyed, but they are not continuing along their pathway of self-destruction. The reason for this apoptosis versus energy is um, simply a mechanism of, of what is happening inside of the cell. Again, obviously destruction makes sense. Destroy those uh, lymphocytes that are causing self-destruction. But energy puts them into this state of unresponsiveness. Eventually they can be released from that state of unresponsiveness and go on to act as a normal lymphocyte would. So what are some of the factors that promote the tolerance mechanism? It turns out that high doses of an antigen does in fact promote tolerance. We're going to look at this in a few slides in just a minute, but the concept here is that if you have something that there's very high concentration of in the host, most likely that is not a potential threat. It is something that's part of the host system. So higher concentrations um, are related to the fact that most likely those components are in fact part of the self and should not be targeted for destruction. In addition, persistence of the antigen in the host. If an antigen is around for a long period of time, this too makes sense that it's most likely something that is supposed to be there, a self antigen, rather than something that has been introduced as an infection as a potential threat. Interestingly, the method of introduction does play a role um, in promoting tolerance. Something that is intravenous um, or subcutaneous will tend to be much more immunogenic, but something that is taken in orally oftentimes initiates a tolerance mechanism. Otherwise, everything we would eat could potentially cause um, an immune response. And so this actually makes sense as well. Uh, the absence of adjuvants also promotes tolerance, and adjuvants are compounds that typically enhance the immune response. We see this with vaccines, typically, um, but if you don't have the adjuvants, you're going to promote tolerance rather than elicit an immune response. But by far, the last on this list is the most important component that plays a role in promoting tolerance, and that is low levels of co-stimulators. What do we mean by co-stimulators? These are molecules, the cytokines, that are typically helping in the immune response. So if you go back to think about what cytokines are doing in allowing for an efficient and well-orchestrated immune response to occur, they are essential components of that immune response. When we have interaction with self-components, we do not typically have that excess of cytokine production because of the way cytokines are produced and are triggered to be produced. So low levels of these co-stimulators, low levels of cytokines promote tolerance mechanisms rather than eliciting an immune response. We can sort of take that statement and change it around and say the levels of cytokines or high levels of cytokines typically induces an immune response. So it makes sense that low levels are going to maintain or promote tolerance mechanisms. So what I want to do is hone in a little bit on T cell specific mechanisms with tolerance and autoimmunity and also talk a little bit about a cell type that we discussed very early on in the semester, but haven't looked at in much more detail since then, and those are the regulatory T cells. We know that there is documented evidence of self-reactive lymphocytes in normal, healthy individuals, but these individuals also have no autoimmune disorder. So there must be some mechanism of regulation that is occurring in these 
normal, healthy individuals, even though there are self-reactive lymphocytes present. It turns out that these self-reactive lymphocytes are in fact the regulatory T cells. So what I want to do is look a little bit more closely at lymphocyte uh, development, specifically thymocyte development within the thymus. <clears throat> so thymocytes again are Im immature T cells that undergo mechanisms to allow for their continual survival and eventual production of functional competent T cells. So in this figure, we're looking at essentially the thymus and a thymocyte up at the top. We know that thymocytes are tested against antigens, specifically self antigens, and their fate is determined based on the way that those lymphocytes, thymocytes, interact with antigen, self antigen. And in this case, we're going to fine tune that response a little bit. Something that has little to no affinity for the self antigen along the left hand side of the figure is going to continue to develop and produce a functional T cell. So little to no interaction with self antigen allows for T cell development. In the center of this figure, we have what we have talked about previously. That is when these thymocytes are tested against self antigen, if they do in fact interact, those cells are targeted for destruction via the apoptosis mechanism. The fine tuning though here is that this is when there's a very high affinity or a strong interaction with self antigen and the developing thymocyte. Again, those cells are targeted for destruction. What I want to add though is that there's actually a category of intermediate interaction or intermediate affinity with self antigen. It turns out that those thymocytes that can in fact interact with self antigen but not too strongly are actually targeted for development as a regulatory T cell. The regulatory T cell's job is to suppress the immune response overall. Because they can in fact interact with self antigens, they basically police other cells to make sure that other cells are not interacting with the self antigens in a specific way. So regulatory T cells do in fact develop from thymocytes. Again, thymocytes that have an intermediate interaction or affinity with self antigen. Specifically, what allows for the development of regulatory T cells is the upregulation of a transcription factor known as FOXP3. This transcription factor allows for the transcription of a number of genes that will then allow for the development of this thymocyte into a regulatory T cell. Again, what regulatory T cells do typically is act in secondary lymphoid tissues and sites of inflammation, and they down-regulate the autoimmune process. They do this by interacting with T cells that may, in fact, recognize a self antigen and they suppress the immune response against that self antigen. So autoimmune disorders dominate when there is a failure of the tolerance mechanism or tolerance process. Interestingly, about three to eight percent of individuals worldwide are afflicted with some type of autoimmune disorder. And of those individuals that have autoimmune disorders, 80% or more are female. The immune response is much stronger in females due to hormonal differences. And I will post a review article for you to read um, dealing specifically with that topic. But what we're looking at in this table is a number of distinct autoimmune disorders. And typically they are categorized by whether they are organ specific, that is, there's a target in a specific organ or tissue system, um, and or systemic autoimmune diseases, which uh, again are affect the entire system of the individual. So again, with organ specific, it is an immune response that's targeted um, specifically to an organ or a tissue. 
it's typically limited to that organ or tissue. What happens oftentimes in these situations is that there's extensive amounts of cell damage that can be either humoral or cell mediated, meaning either by B cells or T cells that recognize self components. And um, with the systemic autoimmune disorders, these are much more broad in range of targets and the number of organs that are affected um, are numerous in these situations. So obviously systemic ones tend to be um, a little bit more severe for individuals that suffer from them than a typical organ specific immune autoimmune response. Now, just like with hypersensitivity, there is not oftentimes clear cut examples of a genetic link. However, there are a few examples where there is a clear cut genetic link. The first example I wanna give you is a disorder known as APECED. It is abbreviated A-P-E-C-E-D, and it stands for autoimmune polyendocrinopathy candidasis ectodermal dystrophy. Hence, it's better to call it APESED. <laughs> In this particular disorder, there is a single gene that has been identified as having a mutation. That gene codes for AIRE, which is the autoimmune regulatory component. If you go back several lectures, back in the beginning of um, parts of the semester, when we talked about T cell development, we specifically talked about the AIRE protein, which was a transcription factor that acted in the thymus to allow for all of the genes to be transcribed and protein products produced so there can in fact be this double checking mechanism to see if thymocytes interact with self antigens. So AIRE again is a transcription factor that allows for transcription essentially of all of the protein producing genes in the thymus so that that mechanism can in fact take place. You can imagine that individuals that have a mutation in this gene making it non-functional or function improperly will cause serious problems downstream in the um, tolerance mechanism because if the gene that is supposed to be turning on the other genes to allow for the double checking mechanism to occur is not functioning then the double checking mechanism cannot occur or does not function properly. Another one that is an extreme uh, disorder that is known to have a genetic component is a disease known as IPEX, I-P-E-X. I-P-E-X or IPEX is short for immune dysregulation, polyendocrinopathy, enteropathy, X-linked syndrome. Hence this one as well, it's easier to call IPEX. It turns out that this is oftentimes fatal in individuals and it is a due to a mutation in the FOXP3 gene. So going back to what we just talked about with FOXP3 being a transcription factor that is essential for the development of the regulatory T cells. In this particular disorder, there is a mutation in that gene. So that transcription factor does not allow for the genes to be transcribed that would allow for the production of regulatory T cells. And that just underscores how important those regulatory T cells are in playing a role in making sure tolerance mechanisms are upheld. Now, as I mentioned, it turns out that most autoimmune disorders do not have a clear cut genetic link like the two examples I just gave you. What I wanna do is just give you two examples of autoimmune disorders to give you some idea of what's happening in these situations. So the first one on the left-hand side is a disorder known as Graves disease. Now Graves disease affects, um, individuals with Graves disease have problems with thyroid hormone production. What I wanna look at first in that panel is what happens during normal circumstances or normal production you have the thyroid and specifically thyroid cells within the thyroid that allow for production of what's known as the thyroid hormone. 
the thyroid hormone plays a role in regulating lots of other components in the cell um, or in the host system. And it is a really important hormone playing a role in metabolic components, mental development, um, lots of important functional features. What happens under normal situations is you have a, a negative feedback control. You have the pituitary gland that produces something known as TSH, which is the thyroid stimulating hormone. The thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH binds to a TSH receptor in the thyroid cell. This then stimulates the production of hormone, specifically thyroid hormone. When there is an excess of thyroid hormone, this then goes back to the pituitary and stops the production of TSH, hence stopping the production of thyroid hormone. And this is a normally functioning system. In individuals with Graves' disease, they have an antibody that has the ability to bind to the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor. By binding to the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor, it mimics the act of TSH and stimulates hormone production. And because that antibody is bound, it continues to allow for overproduction of thyroid hormones. So individuals with Graves' disease um, are in a situation known as being hyperthyroid in that they have too much thyroid hormone production. Another example is the one on the right. The one on the right is a disorder known as myasthenia gravis. And in this particular situation, there are antibodies that are being produced um, that cause destruction of muscle cells overall. So if we look at what happens in a normal situation, you have a nerve ending that typically interacts with um, muscle cell with the release of acetylcholine, which binds to the acetylcholine receptor, which then allows for um, muscle activation to take place. In individuals with this particular disorder, they have antibodies that bind to the acetylcholine receptor, hence not allowing for the acetylcholine to come from the nerve to interact with the acetylcholine receptor. So we have muscle inactivation um, or a lack of muscle activation occurring. In addition, because these antibodies are binding, they are also targeting those muscle cells for destruction. So we begin to see a progressively weakening um, skeletal muscles in these individuals because of that uh, destruction taking place. So what are the, some of the current treatments available to individuals who are suffering from autoimmune disorders? It turns out that immunosuppressive drugs is one of the most common ways to treat individuals with autoimmune disorders. Things like corticosteroids that then uh, reduce inflammation. Um, cyclophosphamide plays a role in also reducing inflammation. So typically immunosuppressive drugs play a role in the reduction of inflammatory components. A treatment that is a little more extreme and might be done in situations with, again, extreme autoimmune disorders is a thymectomy. By removing the thymus, you then remove uh, the location of T-cell development and hence you have a diminished T-cell response. Obviously, this is not ideal because there are T-cells that still function the way that they're supposed to. Um, so again, this is something that would happen in a very extreme situation. Plasmapheresis is another possibility, and with plasmapheresis, essentially what's being done is the individual's blood is being filtered so that the uh, self-reactive lymphocytes are removed, and then the blood is entered back into the host system. This is actually very costly, and so not a usual course of treatment and is not available as a course of treatment for many individuals who suffer from an autoimmune disorder. TNF-alpha blockers fits under immunosuppressive drugs, so really should be under that category. TNF-alpha is a cytokine that promotes the inflammatory response. So by blocking TNF-alpha receptors, we are essentially blocking that inflammatory response. Lastly, what's not on this list are antibody therapies. There are antibody therapies 
uh, that have the ability to bind to specific cells that may be in fact causing the problem overall.